Put on your thinking caps, boys and girls. <laughs> because we're about to enter the realm of ethics and meta-ethics in Ayn Rand. And for people who really care about this idea of what is rational self-interest, what is the fundamental moral framework in which objectivism lives? What did Rand say and how can we go beyond it? How can we extend Rand into practical day-to-day -day work so that we can, if you're interested in that kind of stuff, let's get started because we have John Yakella on the line and uh, Brashawn Martin who is, uh, doesn't have a camera but who will be participating at times to talk about meta-ethics in Ayn Rand and meta-ethics beyond Ayn Rand, right? Using Ayn Rand as a base from which and around which to focus the conversation, we're going to be talking about the heavy duty philosophical stuff today and getting a sense for the work that John has done. Now I'll introduce John for a moment, right? So I met him at an Ayn Rand conference and someone I respected said, oh yeah, so he's, he's a serious dude. And I talked with John for a few minutes and Yes, I speak about meta-ethics, and I have some challenging things to say about Ayn Rand while still being completely on the objectivist train. And I said, ooh, that sounds interesting. And then he sent me an article called Triumph and Tragedy. And I'll, it'll be in the link, it'll be in the show description down below. And I'll, I'll just say this. If you care about ethics, and you care about Ayn Rand, if you take... If you're an admirer of her work, if you take her work seriously, this is a must read because it deals with questions at the heart of her ethical systems, which are difficult to answer. They can be answered in a way that's consistent with objectivism, but offer some serious challenges. And I found it delightful to read. And so after that, John and Brashan and I have had a, uh, several hours of conversations and we decided that today we could begin to introduce, you could say, a fundamental framework for metaethics. How do we approach it? And what are some of the fundamental ideas to get into? And uh, that we see where we went. So with that, welcome, John. Sounds great. It's so exciting to, to have an audience that cares about metaethics because it can be fundamentally and abstract and difficult to get your mind around but it's so potentially rewarding and important especially in validating an ethics objectively which is my concern so how do you do that how do you ground uh, an objective ethics in reality yes. and Rand had some answers Ed. yes and, and I'll say one more thing about this if, if, if we say that ethics is the question of what is good or bad for human being what is worse or better what is thriving or what is shriveling? Right. right? If, we, if we're looking at this question, right, we can come up with answers. But the, the epistemological question is, well, how do we come up with those answers? By what rules do we generate the conversation? By what logical standards do we determine what are the premises? How do we extrapolate from those premises? And that's the, that's the question of meta-ethics. And mm -hmm. if ethics answers the question of what is a good life, how then shall we live, then meta-ethics is the framework that allows us to answer that question. It is, in fact, the most important thing, which is, you could say, why Ayn Rand said fundamentally she's, uh, she's about objective reality. Uh -huh. right? How do we build an epistemology that's based on ethics? So, so I'll just say this is absolutely critical if you take this stuff seriously. I'm curious how you approach it, John. How do you? So, so I approach it answering the question of when you use concepts in ethics, like what's the good life? What does that mean in reality? What does good mean in reality? What does life mean in reality? What's the your definition, and what do you what can you point to that says this is good? What are all the parts and the processes of these things in reality, apart from your specific ideas about what good and bad is, or uh, it's what is it generally in its most fundamental and essential uh, characteristics. 
and Rand had some ideas, and I'll discuss, I'm prepared to discuss those, like what was Rand's views of the nature of the good and the nature of life, because, the, and, and the nature of value, for example, those are fundamental concepts in her ethics, but um, I have a different view than she did, sort of broader and it contextualizes her view, you might say, in relationship, sort of uh, similar to her description in Ito, how definitions evolve as you gain a context of knowledge from a child's definition of man like moves and makes noises to rational animal well I'm moving on beyond that definition into a, a more contextualized definition of man a sort of a incorporating a deeper view of what the nature of life and value is and man and yeah yeah and so as you uh, you could say if we take introduction to objectivist epistemology also known as ito Right. As, as we take this and you, to extend what you just said, in, in that she uses the idea of an evolving definition of a concept, right? that knowledge is contextual, that it grows as we, as we become more complex, as our understandings become more precise, our concepts become more precise and our definitions become more precise. And we, a uh, baby might start off with the idea of you know, man is an animal that walks on two legs, but then it grows and you start refining and refining until you get to rash, man is a rational animal or human beings are rational animals. Yeah. But then is that the end? No, all concepts are contextual. As we get more and more information, as we include more and more knowledge, as we refine our abstractions, as we integrate different abstractions into the piece, our definition becomes more complex. And it sounds like the, the work that you've been doing has been to extend and refine the definition of man and life or human beings and life so that when we ask the question, what is man qua man, we have a, a deeper understanding, a more precise definition of the concept so that we can have better uh, Im implementations of that concept across the board. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. So, so how, how do you want to dig into this? How do you want to start? I, I'd um, like to chime in with just kind of what I mentioned being my interest here, which is to hear John on the most important question of about, uh, so John and I are longtime objectivists. I read it at 17. I'm in my 50s. John's doing this. John's uh, it, really about the same amount of time as I have. So we're longtime study objectivists. So we know her material really well. And what we discovered, mostly John, is that she. Um, Metaethics is generally known, according to Peikoff, as a philosopher's view of the nature of man. And she starts her ethics by saying we need to base ethics on the nature of an organism, uh, the organism of man. And then she proceeds to adopt Aristotle's model and definition of man as the rational animal. And we discovered when we spent a lot of, uh, nine months last year working on this question, she's got three different mutually exclusive models of the nature of man. Uh, oh, particularly quickly, the self. Yeah, quick, yeah the self. So can you quickly go through those three different models? She sees, she sees uh, when we talk about the self, I mean, she talks about the self from three different frameworks. One is the self as the rational faculty, or you could say an organ of this animal organism. Man as the rational animal and this rational faculty is the self. Another view is that this animal, this rational animal, the total mind and body integrated, is yourself. And the other is that these, uh, that the psychological self or ego is an organism that this self is not simply an organ of the animal organism, but is an organism in and of itself that's capable of living or dying independently of the animal, including the body. And this would be her view, say, in We the Living, where she's talking about 
the living is not biologically living because the people in Russia were all you know living biologically, but there's some people that she thought could die sort of spiritually or their ego could die. They have no self. They're not that that sense of the self being alive, which she regarded uh, rather metaphorically. So that the shift that the central shift that I'm making is the idea that the self as a living organism, this ego as an organism, is not a metaphor but actual fact. Actually, that's what we are in essence. And then all the other ideas are getting to there and then implications and applications of that central idea. So if you so it's a very simple idea and all the rest can be viewed around it, either leading up or going away from it. So that's the central idea I think that would be good to hang the focus of attention on and just start with this psychological self that boots up when you wake up in the morning and you see and you have a memory and you see you know your goals for the day and you have a sense of yourself and feelings, all this integrated sense of self. This is an organism with needs like any other organism. It has needs for energy and material and experience and it work does uh, constrains this energy to do work that helps um, maintain itself and, and, or reproduce. And, and reproduce so that's what I that's the central idea that I'll okay so so let me let me uh, pause on that clarify that because if, if that's going to be the starting point let's get let's let's really nail that um, so you you talked about three kinds of three different ways that uh, Ayn Rand talked about the self. One is you could say the the biological self that's associated with the body, and I think you call this a survivalist. The uh, rational animal, you could say, is yes. the animal. This whole thing, what we are, is this, it's seen man as a biological organism with a rational faculty, and the self is this whole organ, this whole organism, mind and body. That's yes. one of the self. Yes. Which, and, that, and that's distinct from the psychological self that you're talking about. The psychological self, yeah, that could be looked at in a couple of ways. And Rand looks at it, views it as, as sort of a, uh, an organ, so not an organism, not independent of the body, but sort of an organ of the body. And... In other words, the rational faculty, if you call that the self, like, and then say, well, being selfish is having that part function well, like to be able to think well, and uh, egoism is somehow like focused around that operating well. So mm -hmm. if you're rational, then you're egoistic, like, like there's a, an equation of those. So... And then the other way being that psychological self is more than just your rational faculty, may include your emotions, let's say. Yeah, may, an may affective include, faculty. May include um, your skills of how to ride a bike or how to, any other things that yourself can, um, can do in the world. That whole complex of everything that's under our volitional control and its psychological products, though that that system is uh, an organism, and that it could die in a way. It has that there is more than one fundamental alternative in the universe, more than biological life or death. There's another fundamental alternative, which is that this s psychological self, as an organism, can live or die and that morality is a guide or ethics is a guide for it to live and flourish and the flourishing of this organism of the self of the psychological self is the cause of happiness and that experience of happiness is just the experience of this psychological self flourishing this psychological organism 
thriving. One is when it internal, thrives, we feel happy. One is an internal perspective, and another he sort of takes as a external perspective. So the internal perspective that we feel when we're when we're functioning as a psychological organism well, that's happiness. And then you recall what flourishing sort of an external perspective on an organism, or I'm not clear what what how flourishing is, is distinguished. Well, yeah, flourishing as Aristotle called it, eudaimonia, that certainly did have an external perspective for him. I think uh, there is a relational, essential relational perspective of thriving, or just like for biological health, it depends on your environment. So what your body does in a, let's say, a cold environment should be different than or what your body does, what a healthy body does in a cold environment should be different than a hot environment. Let's say in a hot environment, you should be sweating, and that's a sign of health, for example. But if you're sweating and it's really cold, that's something's wrong. So there's a sense in which the environment is essential to an understanding of normativity or thriving, flourishing, or happiness, that the environment matters and the self matters and the values that the self is pursuing in this environment matter. They're all, it's all relational. Mm -hmm. So you can't separate, you can't judge the health outside the context of your environment. Oh, I see. So then the calling happiness, the internal perspective is we, we don't typically when we're feeling an intense but, happiness. But happiness I do reserve for this internal perspective. I do say I can I experience happiness when my ego is thriving. It's a way to put it. But the external products of thriving may be value pursuits, it may be physical health or material wealth or friends. Um, love. Okay. So, 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 so I get I get a couple concepts from here. I want to play them out with you. Yeah. Okay. So so first of all, this idea of the psychological self as a as not a separate organism, but an organism in and of itself. A higher order organism than the body. Yeah. Well, it's, or, 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 or I should better say that man is a single organism, and the body is more to the psychological self as a substrate or an organ or a part of. It's a uh, a process within. Um, it's a necessary process so that this ego can exist without the body, without the lower level functions of the body, but it's the highest level, most um, controlling aspect of a human being, the, the, the one that's able to control and guide choices and actions long range, the longest range. At lower levels, we have shorter and shorter range action being controlled at lower levels. So like a reflex of your knee is a very low level thing in your spinal cord from your nerves, your knee to your spinal cord up and down. So that's, you know, not reaching up to this high level, but there's a hierarchy of control of ourself. Our ego is like the highest level of control. Not that our body's one organism and our ego is another different one. It's like we are all one integrated organism, but this, when we think of goodness for the body, if you're an egoist, it's primarily about goodness of the soul, goodness of the ego. How, how is that ego functioning? What's the health of it? And judging the rest of the body in relation to that. So how is this body supporting the ego? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. And, and, and that that is an expansion beyond the idea of a rational animal. It is, it yes. is a psychological, spiritual animal. Uh, you, you, not animal. He yeah, that's the, that would be the organism. Difference. So I'd say that the the essence of man is that we're not an animal, that that we're not even a biological organism, so fundamentally. The, so the genus. I guess. So we're we're essentially a psychological organism, and uh, more precisely, a symbolic organism. So there's something about the way we use symbols and language and stories that's essential to our nature where those constraints operate on each other in a way that channels 
the energy of our positive affects into work to do more constraining, more meaning making of our environment and our experience so that we'll produce values which produce more pleasure, which motivate more of the same kind of work in this cycle. Including moral pleasure. So this, yeah. or enjoyment. Including not moral pleasure. Not just low level. Not just moral, yeah, not just low level pleasure, but particularly moral pleasure, particularly in art. Mm -hmm. But that this cycle of the self maintaining itself, this ego maintaining itself, is an end in itself, metaphysically. Mm -hmm. And we experience that as happiness, as an end in itself. Psychologically, we feel happiness is an end in itself. We don't need any justification for feeling happy, for being happy. But the means to it is not uh, arbitrary. It's very constrained to the needs and requirements of the psychological organism. To the nature which, of the self, some of which is universal and some of which, as by the time we become moral agents, is very specific to, our, to the type of self we've developed. Yeah. <clears throat> yes. Okay, so, so this psychological self, this, this organism, which can live or die, even if the body continues. We yeah. see that in Alzheimer's patient, right? The right. self is gone, but the body there's, lives on. There's various ways that you could mm -hmm. die. There's, but there, when, there's, ver there's various ways that your self can die, die. while, while body. the body lives on. And so, uh, and, and the reason, part of the reason this is important is that in Ayn Rand's ethics, she says that there's a fundamental alternative, life or death. Right. And, and ethics is based on that fundamental alternative of life or death. Now the question becomes the life or death of what? Exactly. Of what? Is it the life or death of the body or is it the life or death of the self, this psychological organism? And you're saying that at times she speaks as if it is the body. Yes. Right? Or sometimes she speaks as if it's the rational capacity, the rational func faculty. Right. right. And, and, and sometimes she speaks about it as this psychological self. Yes, I think um, we have quotes for I, all three I, models. Yes, I think there's a dis I want to make a distinction here Great. because when she speaks of life and death, I think she only does that literally with respect to the man, the animal organism, and that she does it figuratively when she talks about um, metaphorically. This met metaphorically when she talks about the psychological organism by implication. In, uh, so so she'll talk about a self needs fuel, a person needs fuel to go on, things like that. And she'll talk about psychological survival, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in We the Living, the living is this psychological organism maintaining its life. And you that can die, and then now you're dead in a certain way. Um, and that, awesome. and that might, um, so symptoms of being near death might be like depression. It's psychological. It feels bad. You feel like you're, you're harming, maybe going some states of insanity, maybe, um, death in the sense that you aren't able to control yourself anymore. And we, we sort of say that that person is not responsible. We view them socially as they're not responsible for their actions. They're out of control of themselves. And that's the sense in which this ego has died in a certain way, to the degree that's true. If you're not in control of yourself, or even just then it is dead. But that's there's levels of injury, and it feels bad to have it not healthy. And it feels... And, and, and yeah, and this is the other. This is the other part. So first, we're we're expanding the idea of a rational animal to actually recognize that the ego that is integrating the various aspects of our experience, and to the degree that it integrates them rationally, to the degree that they fit together on multiple levels, such that we would, we would all say, of the 
objectively, objectively, we're we're kind of moving away from her focus on epistemology and rationality, more objective, morally objective, and epistemologically objective. So, so before before we get to the difference between morally objective and moral and epistemologically objective versus rational, before we mm-hmm. before we try to untie that knot, I just okay. want to make sure I'm I'm understanding the um, the psychological self is an ego which integrates the various experiences that we're having on an ongoing basis. And the example you just gave of when someone loses the ability to integrate their experience such that their self fractures or the underlying processes which are being integrated by the self, by the ego, right? If that ego, if it breaks, then what happens is we end up fractured into these various parts of ourselves which can dominate. And they might dominate in a way that's destructive to the organism. But that higher level integration of the various parts of ourself, which we call the ego, right? Right. This psychological self can die. Yeah. And and therefore, when when Ayn Rand talks about a fundamental alternative, right? Life or death. The question is life or death of what? And if we shift the focus from the body or the rational animal to the psychological self, Yes. Then that is you're suggesting a more fruitful and true representation of what we are as a self, and therefore yes. what rational self interest means. Yeah. Right. Right. And and I'll the one more one more piece about that. Because the self is an organism. Right, as we explore what it is the self means, it shifts how we think about Ayn Rand's work, specifically in the difference between her nonfiction work in the objectivist ethics and for the intellect, new intellectual, the, the, the various essays that she wrote about ethics specifically versus her characters in her novels. Because right. her characters in her novels are actually more complex than the abstraction that she attempted to define when she yeah. defined objectivist ethics. And that when we look to her work, we should look, as I understand this is one of the premises, especially in Triumph and Tragedy and the work that I'm hoping we're going to get into today, that when we look for the ethics of Ayn Rand, Mm -hmm. although we can use her nonfiction writing as a guide, her nonfiction writing is both not as complete and not as coherent as the actions of her characters Yes. And we can use her characters as a better guide to the morality that serves this psychological self than her actual uh, abstractions and definitions in her ethical, in her explicit nonfiction ethical system. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good, a good point. And what I'm proposing, I think, is in a way more compatible with the fiction. So it sort of um, is not in opposition to what a person who likes Rand's fiction might imagine. In fact, it would make more sense. So it's, it's uh, taking the good aspects of Rand's morality and, her, and, her, and even the good aspects of her ethics and removing any contradic- contradictions and equivocations and uh, various problems with the arguments and their conclusions, which are, I'm claiming, are rather systemic throughout the ethics and weaken it. And even so that you could so I point out places where Rand's explicit fiction, uh, explicit um, uh, nonfiction, formal ethics contradicts her say, actions of morality. her heroes in her novels. So there's this conflict that this shift in perspective from viewing the organism as this, uh, viewing man as an, essentially an animal to this psychological organism, that shift removes the contradictions and aligns better with the spirit of Rand that she portrays in her novels. For example, if you were really heavily focused on, if your standard was the health of the animal, uh, the body, let's say, um, you couldn't justify lots of things that her, her heroes and characters do, which put that, um, they're not indifferent to that, but they, like Rourke going into the quarry, you know, it would have been much better for his, you know, health and wealth 
to not do that, but his psychological self was so demanding and its standards that, that he's willing to risk all that to support what the self, the ego needed rather than, you know, having a, having nice health insurance and, you know, a nice place to live and whatever. Yes. Uh, and, 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 and I think one, one of the things that I find compelling about this perspective that, that Ayn Rand in her characters and in her novels portrayed her morality more effectively than in her nonfiction. And, and I find that compelling for a couple of reasons. One, if you look at any of her characters, they're always making choices. The reason that their choices are heroic mm -hmm. is that they go beyond the idea of their life and, oh, they have to take care of themselves. They, no, they have to take care of their psychological self. They yeah. must be true to themselves. And for that reason, they make right. all kinds of choices that most people wouldn't make that That's would right. actually lead them to more wealth, more health, more social success, more of the things right. that, that support the survival of their body, but not their psychological self. Right. And you can look at virtually every heroic action in any of her novels, and they all have that character. Yeah. Right. And so you're, you're highlighting that. But I, I'll say one more thing about that. Right. Romantic realism. Her theory of aesthetics is that art concretizes morality in a way that the nonfiction cannot. That you need to create this. It's not propaganda. You're creating something that lives this living character or this living work of art that contains more knowledge than you can abstract. And just like when you're looking at uh, the definition of human being, what is a human being? That definition evolves and refines over time. And if you do that rationally, if you do that objectively to get to start to introduce the idea of objectively, if you make your definitions according to essences at the contextual essences that you're working with, a baby, Right. Or a, a young, a young human being might say that, oh, it's an animal that walks on two legs and talks right in the context that it's bringing to order. Those are objective facts. But as you bring more dimensions into the conversation, your definition gets more sophisticated mm -hmm. in the same way. When Ayn Rand looked at her novels and attempted to systematize a nonfiction definition, Mm -hmm. Her definitions were always limited in their context because she was working them out. And so she says a whole series of things, which each one of which are true in their own context, but without the fiction that she had written to integrate them all, they seem contradictory at different points. She'll say, you know, something about life in one thing, and then she'll say something about the self in another right? You, you go through and you offer different examples. When I read her work, I say, oh, in this case, she's using these words with a particular semantic meaning, which is different than this other case. Mm -hmm. And the novels help you integrate those. But if you're just looking at the nonfiction, from my perspective, her definitions yeah. simply aren't sophisticated enough to actually do justice to her novels. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the reason I'm interested in what you're doing is to help uh, increase the resolution of the definitions mm -hmm. so that we can refine her ethics so that it better matches the superior version of ethics and morality that she portrayed in her characters. She was first and foremost a fiction writer. She loved that. She grew up wanting to do that, and it makes sense that that would be better. She's a moralist, of course. Mm -hmm. She wants to project the ideal and what's, what's the best for man, etc. Yes. of course. Yes. She, but she came to philosophy kind of late, later in life. I mean, she's writing journals to get her philosophy down. But to be a formal philosopher, she came to that late in life. And um, I think that's why the fiction is so much better. And, and, and she said specifically that she had to de develop the philosophy in order to do the aesthetics. That, that her aesthetics, her fiction, her creation of the ideal human being. And the, and the context that would demonstrate what that is, like that that was her primary and her philosophy came second. Right. And, so what I, yeah, great. So what I wanted to do is concretize now at this point some examples of where 
we might see her fiction and explicit philosophy contradicting each other mm -hmm. in order to establish a need for this new way of looking at things. New so way I, of looking so at I, so the I, nature the, man. The, the new nature way of organism. shifting the self from this uh, man as a rational animal to a new definition of man, which I could also get into. But what are I wanted to start with some examples where there's clues like there might be a problem. Great. For example, in, in her explicit ethics, when she talks about the nature of, uh, of values depending on life, she wants there to be a necessity for she she wants she wants there to be an objectivity to her normativity to her moral normativity which is based on a fundamental alternative of life or death since she sees biological life and death as the only fundamental alternative in the universe in the case of man it naturally draws her there to man's biological life and she sees and in this framework, she sees reason or rash, rational faculty as a means to the end of survival of this rational animal, mm -hmm. this human being. So you see reason this as a servant, or in service of the life of this rational animal. Now, in her fiction, let's look at, let's say, Galt's threatened suicide. So he lusts Dagny, and when he perceives she might be in danger of being tortured in front of him because the... She can be used as leverage against him. Right. He threatens suicide. Now that doesn't mean that he was offered, he knows he'll be offered an alternative to survive and run the world and get the economy back into shape, which would uh, make his biological organism survive into the future and he could think and put his service towards making that happen and he chooses not to the reason is because he uh, he couldn't be happy if, it, would, it, it would destroy his psychological self it would no, be yes, destroy his psychological his, self. his he would be breaking his integrity he would be out of integrity with his psychological self and his psychological self would literally disintegrate yeah, and he would be at least in pain, and in in his view, irreparable, or it wouldn't be worth living, and he so he chooses to kill himself well, before the other opportunity to get Dagny. Well, he doesn't kill himself. He doesn't kill himself, but he's prepared to. He's, he's, he's prepared to, and he explains his logic, and that explanation of his logic is an excellent example of this discrepancy between her non-fiction description of ethics and her character's description. Right. But you could see the need for an objective ethics, needing to focus on a biological organism. She wants that, that argument to make a firm foundation for object, moral objectivity. So it needs to be tied to an organism, which is true. In order for an objective morality to be validated, you need to be able to point to the organism that's facing it's this nature. fundamental alternative, and, what is and that sets the standard for what is good or bad for that type of organism. So, so, so and this is where we get into the difference between rational and objective. And I and I want to I want to hit this just a little bit, and then have you continue, because because I think I think it's critical as I understand it. So because an organism, a living organism the rational animal, because an animal can live or die, it is either alive or it is dead. So because that's so clear, like we know when an organism, a physical body has died, that serves as an objective fact. We can say it is alive or it is dead. Therefore, the values that lead or the actions that lead towards its continued survival and thriving are good and the actions that lead towards its death are bad. And that is objectively good and bad in the context of the survival of that animal. And that, that is what makes it objective. Is that, am I getting that right? 
it's pretty close. The um, nit I have to to pick is that even it has to do with the relation to the organism itself, and it can be good for an organism, good along the standard of life of a certain type of organism, for it to engage in activities leading to reproduction, which might harm or even kill itself. And so in other words, death can be death of an organism can be a value for that type of organism. In other words, its offspring. If it furthers its the success of its offspring. Yes. Well, or or um, others even of its type. So as we make this distinction between the rational animal, say the biological self versus the psychological self, yeah. right? To suggest that there is an actual organism called the self is an uncommon proposition, right? Yeah. And and that takes some justification. And and we're going to do that in a later conversation when we really get into the work of Terence Deacon because his work in incomplete, incomplete nature is absolutely pivotal for justifying the things we're saying, right? How is it that we could have a psychological self? And what is the nature of that psychological self? Well, that's a function of the evolutionary context in which it was built, right? The, respond, the evolutionary issues that it integrated into higher orders until it became a psychological self. Yeah. A longer, deeper, fascinating conversation that was the beginning of our conversation. Very excited to get into that. But for now, when we say that there is uh, Ayn Rand's nonfiction description of ethics, in which some of the time she talks about just a biological self, life, the fundamental alternative of life or death, and she doesn't distinguish between the biological self and the psychological self. Well, she tries. But her, but her tries. characters, mm -hmm. but her characters demonstrate this difference. And in the process of trying to abstract her philosophy from her characters, sometimes she says things which you can, you can put one phrase in her nonfiction against another phrase in her nonfiction against another phrase and say each one of these is saying different things that are actually contradictory at their simplest level. And we need to look to the context of her writing in order to uh, integrate them into a higher order synthesis. I just wanted yeah. to put one little caveat there. She attempts to make the, the, the switch from simply a pulse on their body to uh, what kind of standards are necessary and needed for the psychological organism. And she does it in, John gave a talk on this, the qua man enigma. And yes. it's man, oh, man. The, the values that human beings need to live as a human being, man qua man. So yes. she, she attempted to do it, and what I hear your argument being is that she, in her nonfiction, did not do that adequately, as well as she did with her fiction. Yes, in her fiction, she didn't need the theoretical, <laughs> to do this theoretical dance, and it's all very clear in the fiction that, like with the example he just gave about Galt, the psychological self, the standards of them, the standards, virtues, and values, and identity of the self reign supreme over any, you know, eating, sleeping, eliminating any other kind of needs that we need for this host. The host comes second. The self is primary in all of her fiction. She's very consistent on that point. But in trying to justify it technically, where she really breaks down is on the equivocation of qua man. That's, you know, that's... John, like I said, did a talk called Rand's Quaw Man Enigma. John wrote a piece called, uh, talking about the Reardon Affair. Um, I can send that to you. It's not posted anywhere. Um, where he shows that um, the whole notion, especially in Peacock, where when you have a discrepancy between your emotions and your uh, conscious thinking about a problem, you, you always go with the conscious thinking. That's Peacock's assertion in Opar. And Reardon does exactly the opposite. His conscious mind is convicted that he should not start an affair with Dagny, yet he desires it intensely, and he does do it. And Rand doesn't say that's immoral. She's, she thinks she's acting and behaving and treating him as a character as if he did the right thing. And that contradicts one big oh. premise in objectivism, or Picovian objectivism, which is you jettison affects in favor of conscious thinking whenever they clash. Okay. 
that's great. it. Great. So expand. So expanding on that example, using what Prashan just what she just brought, how mm-hmm. would you integrate that into this difference between her uh, explicit okay. and her uh, fictional work, and how it fits into the the fundamental point that you're making, which is that there's as we shift to the psychological self. Mm-hmm. Right. We bring in this idea that the psychological self has goals which are passionate, that the psychological self's desires matter in the yeah. ethical equation. You could, you could see your desires and the joy you get from their satisfaction as part of the energy development that this organism needs. Like any, any organism needs energy from its environment right, to survive. It's got to in, in, intake energy and material to repair itself and to maintain itself and to protect itself. Well, the self, the psychological self, requires the same thing. It's not a material thing, so we don't need like food, physical food and, 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 and water. The self is a non-material organism, a symbolic organism. But it needs things like the values art provides, the, the fuel art provides. And I think Rand even uses that metaphor, like art is fuel for our self, our soul, our ego. And without it, we die. We, we lose energy, lose the motivation to do the work that keeping the self alive requires. And another, so, another form of energy would be happy social you know relationships, and uh, and so that's what she's got there. That connects to Reardon passionately pursuing this relationship with Dagny that he wants so desperately. Yeah, you could say that one of the things organisms do is reproduce, and human cells are no different. We reproduce through the exchange of art, for example, and words. We produce our reproduce our ideas through our language and communicating through essays, through science, through speech, and through art in the form of stories. That's a very important way that we produce, reproduce parts of ourselves. So it's children. not DNA, it's, um, it's spiritual or, or moral values primarily. Okay, there's a spiritual equivalent to DNA. This, this uh, You could call them memes or you could call them uh, some form in which human to human transfer of a self can occur. A large part of that is the basic form is a story. And, and, that, and that serves as fuel for the self that it can use to maintain itself and reproduce itself to maintain its integrity. Because like all organic systems, if it's not actively maintaining its integrity, it will, through entropy, yeah. it will disintegrate. Yes. Right. Maintain its integrity, protect itself. Or um, repair itself if damaged. Great. So I'll offer another example sure. in, in terms of the literature. There's, there's a point where Dagny is in the valley. Mm-hmm. And uh, th- someone says to you, what is it that you want to hear from us? Mm-hmm. Right. I think it's, uh, I think it's Wyatt. My, my, but says, wh- uh, if you can remember who it was, it says, what is it that you want to hear from us? Mm-hmm. And she says, nothing. And she, he says, that's not true. Yeah. Here's what you want to hear. Well done. Mm-hmm. Right? And in that moment, right, uh, that is what I believe, I, 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 where I met you, the talk I was giving is love as the ultimate trade. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Excellent. Right? And, and that what love is, is the recognition of another person's ego yes. as beautiful as worthy of respect and admiration and caring and in that moment the the trade that was going on Mm -hmm. was Dagny being given the gift of recognition for who and what she was her ego that fuel made her ego it fueled her Mm -hmm. right and and I want to contrast that Right? Because it was an honest recognition of herself that she could recognize as true and that she could recognize as payment for the character that she had demonstrated to the people. They 
admired her character. And when they acknowledged her for that, she got the fuel. And that's that cycle of social connection that has human beings live. Yeah, it was a, an act of justice in Rand's terms. Yes, yes, exactly. So now I want to offer the contra, the contra example, mm -hmm. right? Which is Lillian Reardon mm -hmm. and James Taggart, where James Taggart gives her the non-material, right? The non-material gift of recognizing that she's the one who manipulated right. Uh, Hank. Right. Right, where she was actually being recognized for the self that she was developing, but that self is fundamentally unjust. Well, what's being shown there is that whether you're in the valley with the good guys, the people that we are like, or they're in the with James Taggart and Lillian, what those two sets of people are doing is sharing each other's standards, virtues, and values. We dislike the, and and can prove that if you want to be happy, what Taggart and Lillian are exchanging there is going to drain their selves and both characters end up kind of wiped out yeah. by the wiped out and or crazy. You know, they, they, they've run out of gas. They've run out of steam. They did their destructive stuff, taken down Hank, and then they just uh, pooped out. And whereas at the end, uh, Dagny and Galt and Hank, and they're all going back to save the world. They've got tons of energy, right? So we can, but, but the basic thing that you've just, those two examples is that they're sharing each other's standards, virtues, and values, whether they're good ones or bad ones, right? whether they're pro-self or anti-self. Yeah, there's a need. Pro-happiness, anti-happiness. There's a, a human need to exchange aspects of ourselves between each other, and there's a correlate feeling, a good feeling when that need is satisfied, and a bad feeling when it's not satisfied. And we, colloquially, we may call it, um, you, you could call it visibility. Um, you, we want other people to see us, to be seen, to recognize us. To, but we also want to be responded to. We want to impact others. We want our self-expression to be seen by others and to impact it. And my suggestion would be that's part, that's a need of the self because it needs, it has a nature such that it's um, functioning well when it's doing the things replication requires, not just self-protection and self-repair, but also replication. And from that metaphysical fact about our nature, we get the foundations for virtues like justice. Or, which is a social virtue, which, which implies is a social virtue. man is, you know, has a social part of his nature. Okay. Yes, yeah. that part of the fuel, part of the, Part of the nutrition that human beings need in order to thrive is that social nature. So I, I want to make one more point on this, and then I want to close this down for a later conversation. Yeah. Right, which is here we're talking about two different meanings of the word ego. Right, that, that what, what we're talking about in, in terms of ego is this higher psychological organism that integrates the aspects of ourselves congruently with increasing right. power. And it uses the fuel of art and uh, social in, uh, interaction with people that you love and respect towards reasons that you want and taking care of yourself and understanding knowledge and grasping reality, metaphysics, epistemology, uh, ethics, politics, aesthetics, that, that mm -hmm. when the ego integrates these things it becomes stronger more alive its self thrives and flourishes and the concomitant of that is the experience of happiness exactly okay meanwhile you can right interact with others in a way that you're not dealing with reality that you're not actually learning new things and integrating knowledge you're not demanding of that yourself you're not taking responsibility for yourself and having integrity you're not uh, interacting with people who inspire you towards things that, that feel, and you're not dealing with beautiful art. And to the degree that you're doing all of those things, yourself disintegrates, it diminishes, and the experience of that is not happiness. It's a right. sickness. Okay. It's a, yeah. there's a foot, psych, suffering. Okay. Right. And, and we call, and in our culture, we call that being egotistical. All right. Okay. Right. So there's the ego in terms of actually 
dealing with reality, using reason, taking responsibility, um, approaching others with respect and service of the realization of art mm-hmm. and beauty, right? This wholesome Ayn Rand hero way of dealing with these five fundamental alternatives. And then, and we call that being egoistic, right? Mm-hmm. This is the healthy ego, the psychological self flourishing versus yeah. the false ego or being e- egotistical, mm-hmm. right? Which is people say, oh, you're just being ego, you're just being egotistical. And what they mean is that the self that you are trying to maintain is actually fundamentally not real. It's, yeah. it's not based in the reality of what you think and feel. It's not based on your best knowledge and integration rationally. It's not based on you taking responsibility for your life. It's not based on actually interacting with other people in a way that's beautiful, in a way that's just. And it's not based on working towards beauty. And so you've got these two different kinds of ego. Yeah. Right? So there's ego and egotism. And she talks mm-hmm. about egoism versus egotism. And, yeah. and, I, and I think this is a, a brilliant topic, perhaps for, for another time. And I think the, the third example in the work that really draws that out is Cheryl and um, James Taggart. Because Cheryl thinks she's viewing an egoist. An egoist. Yeah. And so she keeps reflecting back the greatness of, mm-hmm. of Dagny's Yes. Right. Focus on reality and reason and responsibility, respect and realization. Right. And mm-hmm. she keeps complimenting James, even though he's not dealing with reality. He's not using reason. He's not taking responsibility. He's not demonstrating respect. He's not realization. And that he he tries to take sustenance from that. She's admiring things about him which are not true and he tries to take sustenance from that and it destroys him that fuel is not true for him so i just want to lay that out for the beginning of a a later conversation because i think it's a little bit off far afield but it's so good i had to say it well to to try to bring that back to where we were with the distinction between the fiction and the non-fiction as far as the uh contradictions between the explicit ethics and the fiction, how does that apply to the, what we just talked about? Is there, do you see a problem? Is there some contradiction between, let's say, Rand's fiction and response to, uh, with well, Cheryl? Oh, okay, oh, yeah, so here's, here's the contradiction, or here is, and, and again, the way I understand it, I don't see any contradictions in Rand's work. I have, I have yet to find contradictions in Rand's work. What I do find is places where her formulations are yeah. insufficiently precise that mm-hmm. when you take one formulation and put it against another, it doesn't seem to fall apart. And the thing I like about your work is you provide the larger context in which to interpret her various statements. That's how I see it. We, mm-hmm. You and I might see that differently. But she talks about um, uh, psychoepistemology and the difference between uh, Peter Keating's character and Howard Rourke's character, or in this case, Dagny in the Valley, or Howard Rourke when he's talking with Stephen Mallory, or Howard Rourke when he's talking with uh, Gail Winand, and Gail Winand's in his power. Peter Keating bases his self on other people's vision of himself. Mm -hmm. And Ayn Rand says, that's not good. Other people's standards, virtues, and values. Correct. And, and, and who they think he is, even if it's not true. And, and, and she, in her, in her ethics, she points out again and again that that is wrong. That is bad. That is dysfunctional. It's, and to the degree you go down that road, it's evil. It's like trying to substitute someone else's self inside of your own organism. Right. right? And, and, and in her nonfiction, I think she makes that very clear. What she doesn't make clear in her nonfiction, uh, to, to my knowledge, please correct me, what she doesn't make clear in her nonfiction is the psychological value of being seen in the way that Dagny was seen, in the way that uh-huh. Stephen, Stephen Mallory was seen, in the way that Gail Winan was seen. Yeah. Like the, the, there is a fuel that comes with the ego being seen versus the egotism of Peter Keating being seen or the, or the actual absolute evil 
of Ellsworth Tui, uh -huh. right? That, so, that, that, that she didn't clarify that in her nonfiction. She didn't show the positive side of that in her nonfiction the way she did in her fiction. That's the, the contradiction that I'm seeing. I don't know if that fits for a you. Bit of, a bit of a gap for you there. For missing piece that explains the nature of art, like what the fuel part of it, why does that why is that needed? Yes, and specifically how she she explicitly says that art is a source of fuel. Yeah. And in her fiction, she makes it clear that social relationships with people that you mm -hmm. act, who actually deserve respect, mm -hmm. the relationships with them in which you see one another gives you fuel. Mm -hmm. But in her nonfiction, she focuses on how other people's opinions of you are, is dysfunctional, that to the degree that you care about that, right? Mm -hmm. To the degree that you care about the emotions that that creates, right? Emotions are not tools of cognition, which is the other piece we want to get back to. I'm mm -hmm. not sure if that fits. I'm like, we're playing back and forth. What do you think? Yeah, I think there's a gap in her argument about the need for the nature of art. You could ask fuel for what organism? So we know that human beings need food for fuel for their bodies. But she's talking about something different. She's talking about fuel for the soul, you could say, or for the ego. And if you regard the ego as an organism, it's perfectly plain why an organism needs fuel. Every organism needs fuel. According to its nature. But if the ego is just the rational faculty, if it's just a um, organ. organ of a physical body, then it's not so clear why that needs this special kind of, or even what fuel would mean. Whether it's the concept of fuel or social um, in, social intercourse, either one don't make as much sense right. as if it's for an organism. And so, so that's one thing is is why, why do we need this uh, fuel if the ego is not an organism? Because it's clear that if it is, then or any other or, organisms needs fuel. And then the nature of art being. Uh, psychoepistemological. So that's Rand's theory of art, that it's fundamentally psychoepistemological, which goes along with rationality being the basic virtue. Right? Mm -hmm. And art serves a need of integrating epistemologically, and she's theoretically very epistemologically centered in her view of art. But there's also this the fact that her novels and even parts of her theory emphasize an affective or emotional uh, nature to art that there's this that this is also important a desire like her characters are motivated by passions she's a man's a passionate valuer and that's also an essential part of art that's rather unexplained theoretically but we could feel the passion we could feel the we, we, we enjoy Rand's art because it has this passion in it. But where is the need in her theory that explains why art is not more centered on strictly epistemology and why the passion is needed to be brought into it in the incorporation of our feelings? Again, if you bring in the ego as organism and you see the emotions as um, fuel or part part of the uh, um, fuel giving process, which includes the acquisition of values, the interpretation of them as something good that brings um, satisfaction to needs of the self and joy and like the joy of romantic love satisfied, for example, that um, energy is able to fuel, or, or the or the energy of of art. In fact, she says in the Fountainhead, you know, the sight of the bicycle rider looking at Howard Works um, building. Manondock Valley. Manondock Valley gave him fuel for a lifetime. That power, that fuel, 
that art gives is emotional or affective generally in nature. The self has affects associated with its needs being met, including the, the needs for um, self-maintenance, self-protection, self-repair, self-reproduction. These fundamental activities of the self feel good when those needs are satisfied. And art that includes this affective element is essential to fuel this ego as organism. And it makes sense if the ego is an organism. If it's not, then there's a question mark of why art needs to include this. Why can't we have art that's more like you know, scientific literature? Why does it need to be emotional in, in nature? Mm -hmm. So, so, so and, th and this brings up another piece, which I'm not sure if now is the time to go into it, but I definitely want to bookmark it and I want it because it, it fits so well, right? If, if we're looking at the difference between, to simplify our terms, a, mm -hmm. a biological self with rationality as a faculty and this rational, this rational animal is what we're trying to preserve versus the psychological self, right? Right. Ayn Rand is fond of saying that emotions are not cool tools of cognition. Right. That emotions are the result of our cognition based on our premises. And if the uh, emotions are not part of the rational animal, they're concomitant, they're extra, they're epiphenomenal. Epiphenomenal. Vers ver versus the emotions are actually fuel they and fundamental to the self. We're, ex we're extending by understanding the psychological self, which is fully represented in Ayn Rand's literature, but not fully represented in her non her nonfiction. Her theory. That, yeah, in her theory. Her, her practice is better than her theory, right? Yeah. So in, in doing that, what we're saying is as we understand this psychological self as an organism, we recognize that it is more than the rational faculty yes. and that one of its central fuels and one of its central measurements is this phenomenological experience of joy and happiness or pain and suffering, right? Yeah. That, that, that if one of the central critiques of Ayn Rand is that even though her characters feel, even though when you read your books, read her books, you feel and the emotions are so critical to it, her mm -hmm. nonfiction doesn't take emotions into account, doesn't integrate them to the level that her fiction does. And so by adding this level of psychological self, we're actually bringing the emotionality which is present in her novels back into the nonfiction understanding. We're, we're creating a space for that emotion, that full emotionality that I love so much in her novels. Right. We're bringing right. it back into her nonfiction. Or we're without, bringing it into the understanding. Yeah. What? Without, without the objectivity. That's another key point. So, is so that the emotions the, need to be reintegrated into morality after. without losing, or, yeah, I. Without losing the objectivity. Objectivity. So, how do you do yes. that? Yes. And the ego as organism is the foundational way to. to do that the bit the metaphysical basis for doing that it's saying that emotions and knowledge or more precisely the affects associated with the ego getting its needs met or not met moral affects. moral affects if if you will it's a bit of a misnomer but um it points in a direction it points in a direction but I'm, I'm referring to the affects of the self we don't have english words for it uh, yet for making this distinction. So sometimes also been a call of the emotions, which are not precisely the same thing. But affects associated with this self um, need to be integrated into moral judgments. Objectively, objective moral judgments need to take them into account. And you can do that the fundamental alternative morality is based on is the life and uh, is the life and death of the ego, and 
then you could say, well, what needs for what what is my need for the emotion and how 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 does deciding one way or the other uh, how does taking my emotion my emotion into account in a decision affect the health the thriving of this ego and you can make decisions based on that moral uh, uh, you can make objective moral decisions based on the objective life or death of the ego as an organism basically but yeah. to go back to the original point mark where she's constantly hammering uh emotions are not uh tools of cognition that um that doesn't mean that they're irrelevant and her attitude in her nonfiction and her theory is that and her basic model in my view is that emotions are like exhaust that come out of a smooth running car's engine and we disagree with that model. We believe that validated, key point, validated emotion can objectively be brought into a moral decision. And she does, her technical, theoretical work says no. You and, can't. And, P, and Peacock has extended that. Yes. Yeah, you could, you could say that... Um, Peacock says, think right to feel right, basically, which contradicts the ability for people to hate the good for being the good. If you know what the good is and you hate the good, that contradicts the idea that, the you idea that right. if you know the good, you'll love the good, that you'll want the good, that you'll desire the good. So we know from looking at people that people could know what the good is. Say like a Tui person like that can know what the good is and hate it because it's good. And that contradicts the idea that all you need to do is understand the good and then you're going to feel like doing it. But there's a requirement in Rand's philosophy to line up your thinking and feeling so that you're doing what you desire. So it's not like morality is some grudging thing. we got to reluctantly pursue while we want to do something else. No, they're supposed to be lined up in her view. But the technology for lining them up is more than just thinking. So there's an emotional element that needs to be involved in the process, in the work of lining up our thoughts and our feelings so that we end up doing what we feel like doing. And I think the process of doing that is story development and the form in which we complete that work is a story and those stories are absorbed into ourself and become part of us and that process lines up the, the thinking and emotion and everything but a story is more than just knowledge it also involves action component and a purpose and obstacles and feelings all those are integrated all these different parts of the self are wrapped up in the form and, of story. And, and, and when you understand that for a story to work for a story to actually be fuel for a human being, it's more than just knowledge. Mm -hmm. It is, it is the goal and the obstacle and the characters and the challenges. Like it, it is that unfolding of the narrative that when you understand yes. that the self, the psychological self we're talking about is, right. is, uh, fundamentally composed of or intimately connected with narrative. Yes. That we transcend the idea of a rational argu rational animal, the idea of emotions are not tools of cognition, to there are types of emotions and we can differentiate between them objectively, which yeah. serve as fuel for this narrative psychological self. And in that sense, they are tools of they are tools of survival. They are tools of integration of narrative, even if they're not necessarily tools of purely rational cognition. I'm not sure that's a, would, I'm not sure how you feel about that formulation. Yeah, I would, I would formulate it as emotions are part of the tool set or the set of processes that are essential to objective moral evaluation. Or at least they can be when they're validated. Well, they they can be. Yeah, you should validate. But they're essential. That's the point. That's the difference. 
so you sh you can't say that um, that as Rand does, there's an error in in holding that reason is one's only judge of values and one's only guide to action. So that's from the objective of ethics, that idea that reason can guide your actions and judge your values and that emotions are set to the side to focus on what's the truth. You can't live by that. No one does or has or could and the characters in a fiction don't operate that way. Their emotions are part of their way they evaluate. Like I'm thinking of Rourke now deciding whether he's going to build this bank building in some style he doesn't like and he's feeling a passion for his plan and he's feeling a version for this other one. Those matter. The fact that he didn't want to matters to what is moral, what the moral choice is for him. So how do you bring emotions into such emotions into ethics, into moral evaluations without losing objectivity? And and that's why again we're we're exploring the concept of why does it matter? Is there a problem in yes. the existing objectivist yeah. canon? Is there a problem that we need to solve? And this is the fundamental this is the fundamental expression of the problem is that her characters use emotions and their emotions are integrated into their quote rationality. Their rational self-interest includes and integrates their emotions in the larger psychological self that they are and the narratives they're creating to support that self. And her nonfiction doesn't clarify that. Is it, am I getting that right? It. It's worse. It goes against it. Okay. Yeah. And it, and, it, and it integrates them more than motivationally. It integrates them as far as direction, not just like, oh, I'm energized to do something. There's a directional component to affects generally. Certain action tendencies are favored over others. So Rourke had favorite building styles that he liked and desired and wanted versus versus others, right? So there's a direct, there's a evaluative component that emotions essentially bring to moral objectivity that I wanted to bring into the discussion. Okay, so as we get into this, you could say, questioning of the god of Ayn Rand. How dare you question the goddess? Right? As as we get as we get into this, the question becomes what is it that you're trying to accomplish? Like why why are you treading into such you could say dangerous technical waters and such potentially inflammatory waters in the objectivist community? Like what is what's your purpose? What is your your reason, your motivation behind the inquiry that you're engaged in. Yeah, so my ultimate end is my own happiness. And what, and my background is being sort of a deep thinker about whatever field or interest that I have. I'm very in my head, very logical, right? Very systematic, as well. systematic thinking. So that's the background, even before Rand. So when I approached Rand, I loved her system building. That was great, in my view. Ooh, that's super. Mm. But uh, it was the novels that really blew me away. It was those, those that touched me emotionally. And that left an impression, sort of an unanswered question of, so I'm operating in my head here, and the novel writing seemed like a far distant thing, like something that I couldn't approach. It's like, because it requires some level of emotional integration that I wasn't equipped with when I met Rand at 29, and I discovered both the fiction and the nonfiction at the same time. And I absorbed it all in like five months and was just super excited and enamored of, of, of that whole thing. It's just life transforming. I went from religious Christian into an atheist and, and got an interest in philosophy. So, but there was a certain 
um, emotional or a certain disdain for emotion that I came in with for so, sort of like a lack of skill of that because I wasn't taught that you know my emotions were something that I should be paying attention to and integrating and um, it was like more brought up to be well what God wants to, is the important thing what you want you know <laughs> not so much not so right much. There, yeah, your 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 job is to fit into yeah. our world. Thank you. Very so much. there's a lack of skill in that area, and then I come into Rand and I and I read, reason is your only judge of values and only guide to action, and I go great, I got that, <laughs> I'm all set. Until he met me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, until I met Brashan, and she said something about motivation matters and all this messy stuff, and I go, I don't think Rand says that in there and I go study for a year the objective is ethics and going what 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 is she really saying there and come to find out like we were both right it was like motivation and the affective side the emotional side um, actually matters to getting happy but Rand does actually say things like Reason is your only judge of values and only guide to action and emotions aren't tools of cognition implying that, you know, cognition and knowledge should be your guide to action and emotions are epiphenomena like exhaust coming out of the engine of your rational faculty that that you um, that don't have a guidance role. And so I felt like I fit in, but I realized that, oh, Rashawn was right and uh, there's a problem actually in the ethics and and that shifted my attention to go okay well how deep does the problem go it's like pulling on a little string and you keep pulling and you're going so I was adverse to wanting this I was adverse to wanting emotions as something that I needed to be skilled at and pay attention to it, it wasn't something that I felt competent at. It was not something that I thought Rand required in her view of morality, her view of ethics. So it was a deep, problematic, troublesome transition to get the first inkling that Rand might be wrong and then following that thread because I was committed to reason and, and objectivity and it like absorbed that part of the process, the method of her method of thinking, basically applied to her own work, led to the step-by-step -step systematic analysis to see what I concluded eventually, well, well, there's a systemic problem in the objectivist ethics, and that it will um, require repair and an understanding to motivate me, being such like a, a rational person and not wanting to go down this path anyway, so I come kicking and screaming sort of like to this conclusion that, oh, this whole affective side is important and I'm not good at it. I don't know what I'm doing and I like to know what I'm doing. And so motivation now yeah. to figure out what I need to do. So, so, so let, let me feed this back to you because it's just, a, it's just really fun. It's really fun. So on the one hand, you're not good at emotions. They're troublesome and problematic. And so you don't want to deal with them. And then she comes along and says, reason, you don't need emotions. Yay. Right. <laughs> Except. Well, yeah. She, not she, 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 yeah. She also says, check your mm -hmm. premises. Contradictions do not exist. If you think you have found a contradiction, you will find that one of your premises is wrong. So check yeah. your premises. And so you, in recognizing both, that when you're reading her novels, her characters are passionate and alive and driven by this deep psychological, emotional, passionate thing. And you compare that, you it's time, there's a yeah. potential contradiction. It's time for you to check your premises. And that has led you down the path that you're on for the conversation we're about to have in, over, the, over a number of yes. conversations to really explicate this very deep, and insightful and practically helpful way of engaging with Ayn Rand's work so that you can 
so that each person who's going can check their own premises and integrate this idea that on the one hand, her characters mm -hmm. are passionate. And on the other hand, her philosophy seems somewhat dry of passion. Yeah. Can, can, can I just inject here because I feel like the elephant in the room? Mm. Uh, it was an <laughs> sure. ongoing debate between me and John, uh, not on, on top of his own study of Rand and on top of, I mean, I'm not totally disagreeing with this, but I don't think it was just the fiction. It was that I got Atlas Shrugged at 16 and I totally was already a very emo emotional person. And I also read some early Brandon that she had approved of in one of her newsletters where he said, and this was really a profound moment for me, 17 years old, I'm reading all of her work, and he says, and she approved, this statement, something to the effect of, when you have a clash between reason and emotion, you don't know if it's the reason that's right or the emotion that's right. You have to investigate further. And I believe he even used the Reardon case with the affair with Dagny where he said there's an example of the emotion side being right against the conscious conviction side being right. And I 100% agreed with this and carried this forward, you know, smash cut now I'm 26 or seven years old and that's when I meet John and we get together. So I have no problem with emotions. I have no problem with the idea that they can be part of a moral judgment. But I'm doing all of this very implicitly and not really like a top-down manual thinker, systematizer like John is. I'm more, you know, um, getting it in a sort of intuitive sense from going from the fiction, etc. And so that led to endless, literally, it was Thunderdome between us, okay? It's not just Rand's fiction where he's getting that emotions need to be brought in. It's also me bringing emotions and encouraging <laughs> him to do that, but also saying to him, look, I remember this, this statement explicitly. When I first said to him, he, he came to me one day and said, I'm, I've given a perfectly rational argument. You can, if you cannot find any problem with this argument, then you must do X, Y, and Z. And I said, well, what about your motivation? And he said, what does motivation have to do with objectivism? <laughs> and I said, look, she doesn't want just want objective epistemology. She wants objective ethics. That's why she calls it objectivism. She wants it applied to, to all of these. To, to metaphysics and epistemology and ethics, which means values, which means feeling, yes. caring. Yes. So right. The, the affect, the affect of the yes. self. And so politics and deeper stuff. sense, it was me getting the fiction and intuiting the philosophy from the fiction, him being a manual thinker, getting the theory, and us clashing on a very regular basis about what that implied, about what the ethics needed to be that, um, that really led to where we're at now. So, so, so I'll, I'll say one thing about this. Uh, so... I, I write books on relationships and like practical stuff. I have an entire course on relationships. And one of the, one of the key ideas in the course is that um, the difference between my experience of reality and the other person's experience of reality offers the opportunity for both of us to expand our world and refine ourselves. And so it's where the conflict right. is that right. we're most likely going to discover about ourselves and others. It's what brings us past our current thinking into it. It is, in fact, the conflict, the contradiction, that when you approach it correctly, you actually go, you use the contradiction to unearth and excavate the premises so that you can then build a higher order concept that integrates the seemingly disparate right. contradiction. That it's the higher order, so it's, it's fun that, like, in my, in my work, it's this idea of contradictions do not exist. Check your premises. That is at the heart of how I view human relationships and human mm. conflict. And that your human relationships and human conflict caused you to check yeah. the premises to create yeah. this conversation. Yeah, specifically John, like he said, spent a year analyzing in detail. It's really hard to imagine anybody doing that in my view, but uh, uh, analyzing her objectivist death. Thank God yes, for John. bravo. 
um, she, she says in a quote in our paper, Triumph and Tragedy, that she needs a Plato or a Socrates to take her good ideas and create a system. And what that means is a systematic thinker. And John is precisely that. And that's why all these kind of people like me who kind of get the gestalt of her don't see a problem, right, between the ethics, between the morality and the, fiction, and the fictional pre presentation of her philosophy, which is what she's doing in her fiction. She's presenting a new philosophy. Um, so it was, thank God for John and his desire for precision and system, because otherwise we never would have gotten here. Bravo. Well done, John. Well done. So in terms of the motivation, in terms of what this conversation and the future conversations are really about, it's about how do you become yeah. happy using this philosophy? And because you're so committed to that, you're willing to question Ayn Rand, the woman who created the context, both in terms of her nonfiction and her fiction, you're willing to challenge the things that she said or the things that she was incomplete about in service of that which she was truly in service. Yeah, I'll say that I agree on the essentials and I could delineate like what are the essentials that I agree with Rand on? Like happiness orientation, very important, fundamental that we agree and objectivity that's another pillar, another pillar that's important uh, degree in egoism, the importance of the, the integrity, integrity of the, of the self, self, that it's well-being, that it thrives, that it's uh, important. And also um, another one would be benevolence, sort of an attitude that my happiness and others' happiness are mutually compatible and even supportive. That this is the this is the yeah. valley. Yeah, that, at least similar. At, uh, at least certain others. Certain others. At at least, um, if you're not a psychopath, you're potentially supportive of each other, and and you have a harmony of interests. If you're after happiness, realize that your ego needs to thrive for you to be happy, and so you have a concern with that functioning well, and you're, you're taking responsibility for it, which is essential for it to function well because you're you're in the driver's seat you're you are your ego so others can't do that part for you and that to do that you need to be objective and that but each one of those pieces sort of gets an expanded definition a, a wider context is integrated so happiness objectivity egoism um you could even say benevolence. They're all they all get some uh, ex expanded definitions and descriptions in a in a wider. So it's going around the spiral to to come back to those same concepts and make them richer. But those I um, agree with, expand on, and then point out different issues where there's some either contradictions or equivocations or circular definitions or some some type of um, non-objectivity in the explicit philosophy that when corrected makes the fiction understandable in a way it wasn't before. So the fiction has come alive for me in, in a new and more powerful way and I'm appreciating that even more. And not to say that you know you can't also point out uh, problems in the fiction. I think like you could imagine that the wrong, so some philosophical errors might creep in, and I think that happened a bit more with Atlas Shrugged than the, some of the earlier ones, but, um, uh, and, and that could be another topic that we go into about, you know, yes. fiction. Absolutely. But, but it comes back to happiness for my own sake and then happiness for others, the people in my life that I care about in the world generally, I want people to be happy. I think philosophy is important to understanding how to do it, particularly ethics, yes, epistemology and metaphysics and stuff, but my attention was drawn to meta-ethics because it's the foundation, the sort of the cultural turning point, the foundation of what needs to be changed in the individual and also in our culture for cultural transformation to get 
sort of we got out of balance with Aristotle's uh, and the scientific revolution with epistemology. Philosophy has been very epistemologically centric for a few hundred years and ethics relatively primitive. And I think it allows us to bring the chance of existential destruction of some sort with technology like nuclear weapons, but morality so primitive that we might end up using them, for example. And that imbalance is culturally, un leads to an unstable culture. So to fix that fundamental problem, you basically need an objective morality where to apply objectivity to morality in the way we applied it to thinking about the world around us so that they're balanced. And then that will give us the wisdom, the moral wisdom to guide our use of technology in a better way. So I think that's a real important application that we see the results of like not having that balance in our culture today where technology is being misused and will be misused. And we need to bring the moral and objective morality. I think that's the only way to integrate and unify um, man. We need to re-understand the nature of man as this uh, symbolic organism that has its own needs for a certain morality and this is shared across all human beings. It's available to, to everyone. Now, there's different, uh, I want to not go into this, but just open up the possibility that the nature of morality depends upon the nature of the self and that there's different levels of self-development that might require different moralities. And that Rand was looking at a certain nature, certain level of self-development self-authoring self that was like a Howard Rourke or a John Gall that needed a certain kind of morality and that's the one she's focused on but bracket that there are that there are different, different stages, stages of development and 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 as the self shifts as the nature of the self develops and becomes more complex and more comprehensive and more integrated that its needs what is nutritious to it also expands and that and that brings us into the conversation of ethics and meta-ethics. Yeah. So, <clears throat> let's say that we have given enough examples that we can say that there is a need for an integration of Ayn Rand's fiction and nonfiction, and that it's worth actually exploring it. Mm -hmm. Let's just say that. Now, let's do an entire session at one point, just going through all of the potential reasons why that would be useful. But let's say we've given some examples. The question becomes, now what? What is the value? Where do you where do you go from here? Yeah, so exactly. Good point. Where do you go? How is this applied? What difference does it make to my happiness? These theoretical ideas. And how does it how has it affected my happiness and how do I how would I apply it? So what, when I think about that question, the first thing that comes to mind is my conscience. Your conscience. And my conscience. Because my theory of your conscience, or you could say moral intuition, is that it is a reflection of yourself or your ego, your psychological self or your ego, is experienced by you as your conscience. And that's the form in which you're getting day-to-day, moment-by-moment guidance from yourself. And that is a shift from the view that guidance is from knowledge alone, you know, this rational Thing where ultimately everything is processed by your thinking. So I think thinking is important. Knowledge, reasoning, that's crucial. And objective thinking is crucial to proper guidance. But it needs to be 
the, the um, knowledge is stored as part of a bigger self that has other constraints on it, including the affective and your purpose and the um, obstacles you're facing and your skills. This, this fundamentally narrative context. The narrative context. So working with narratives, particularly art, particularly story, like Rand's fiction, like she was an artist, I don't think this was a, uh, a this was a, this is an important expression of what I would consider like the implicit morality of Ayn Rand, that she was exemplifying not just a career for herself, but an example of a way of evaluating, a way of approaching the world through narrative that's universally applicable, as widely applicable as thinking is. So it's not that everyone should make a career of being a novelist, but it's just the idea that evalu moral, doing moral evaluation in story form is universally important to people. And we kind of already do it, but not so objectively where we're validating our stories and making them explicit and standing putting them out from us and and criticizing and you know that kind of thing that's a potential that we've done in the area of epistemology logic and logic and formalize the forms and we got that down pretty well right but we need to do a similar thing in the area of moral evaluation but the form specifically is specific and not Moral evaluation in terms of the logical extension of a set of premises according to a set of rules to determine yeah. what theoretically ground yeah. up should be, but rather moral right. evaluation in terms of the entire impact of the story on yeah. the self as regulated through the conscience, as expressed through the conscience. I think ultimately you need to make your conscience the final arbiter. Even though you consciously think things through and you reason, blah, 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 you can write your papers and do thinking on paper and writing and discussing and arguing. Writing and books like. Writing and, books. And writing things like the objectivist ethics. Objectivist ethics. All that is great and fine and wonderful and important to even um, to validating your conscience because that's another new kind of validating yourself so that your conscience gives you good guidance validating and correcting errors in yourself so that your conscience gives you good guidance so it's not to do away with the conscious it's not to say oh i'm all subconsciously guided it's that we can't help but be guided by our conscience it's just a matter of have you validated what work have you done to make it objective and this sort of solves this problem that the objectivist has with the, the moral intuitionists who, who want to say, because this sounds like moral intuitionism, and, and you could go, well, that not that not objective, is that's the fundamental. But you have to go a step further. You can't make your conscience, whatever you happen to um, intuit is moral in a certain case, you can't make that a fundamental factor in guidance. You have to externalize it in the form of story, consciously evaluate it according to objective principles of, of ethics, and then transform, edit your story, and reconsume it so that yourself is now changed, different, better, improved. Validated. Validated. And you integrate this with your whatever conscious um, uh, evaluations you can do for a particular decision, you know, when, when the decisions are big, let's say a career choice when you're going to college or something, what I'm, or who am I going to marry or some decision that's worth maybe spending a lot of time evaluating. Story forms are particularly important and good to use in those contexts but it's not like you can write a novel for each decision that you make in your life that's not going to happen so you need this guidance by your moral intuition the practice so so the that's where the the rubber meets the road but you can't go by just what however my conscience guides me you have to take responsibility 
for understanding yourself, for ex and you do that by through self-expression, through particularly important is self-expression through uh, story. That's the that's the form in which ob moral objectivity needs to take. But it's because what's missing from the whole focus on epistemology and the rational faculty is that there's something going on in the affective world that is different than concepts, concept formation, concepts stringing together, etc. And the difference is we call we have a paper we're working on called grouping versus ranking. So what you're doing when you're dealing with evaluation is a fundamentally different process than what you're doing when you validate concepts or build concepts or string concepts together, qua David Kelly's logic textbook. There should be effectively a, a textbook like David Kelly's logic textbook, but that centers around evaluation, the process is evaluation, which include premises and concepts and propositions and so on, but they're richer and they're based on hierarchies of values, rankings, et cetera, which are different than what you in concepts. So, <clears throat> yee was that a lot of stuff to unpack? So let me let me feed a couple pieces back. Mm -hmm. Okay. So first of all, I heard a type of sequence that if if you recognize that morality and the morality of guidance to make the self flourish that we experience as happiness. That if we've got this psychological self, we want to act in such a way that it nourishes the psychological self, that it increases its integrity, that it yeah. flourishes and grows, such that it has energy to do more work, such that it can flourish and grow, and that that experiences happiness. Uh -huh. That in looking at that, it's not enough to look just to rationality and logic. That we must look to a deeper context of the entire psychological self and that yeah. the experience of that in terms of our uh, deeper context is this intuitive this mm -hmm. conscience which yeah. is an integration of a whole series of pieces and that that conscience we experience it as a feeling we experience it ph phenomenologically first and foremost we're confronted with the situation, we evaluate the situation, we determine what's happening and what it means, and then we have a conscience reaction, a phenomenological towards or away from good or bad, yes or no. Mm -hmm. But that that's not enough. Yes. That if we take that conscience and we put that into a narrative, if we express that and ex explicate that into a narrative, the more detailed that narrative, the more that narrative maps on to the experiences we're having, the more we can then experience that narrative as an opportunity to clarify our conscience, to clarify the premises that lead to our conscience, to clarify the, un the unspoken yeah. dynamics and the unspoken constraints that are leading to the conscience that aren't currently part of our rationality. Mm -hmm. But by examining our conscience and putting it into narrow form, we can actually start to discover the things that we haven't yet included in our rationality. Not just rationality, yeah. but our mm -hmm. ranking. There can be contradictions, yes. in our value rankings. And that's one of the things we're trying to ferret out and find out that's happening. Yeah, that's... And, and, that's okay, oh, okay, okay, so with that, so there's, there's this understanding that our conscience includes more constraints than our current model, than our current yeah. rational model, including our current model of values and our current explication of, oh, this value is more important than this. And right, our yeah. conscience contains more information than our model. Did I get that part right? You mean the current model that yes. RAND provides us? No, I mean, I mean so uh, yes, yes and no. So let me clarify. So myself individually mm -hmm. i have both a conscience that guides me as i'm going through the world in each and every moment i'm essentially evaluating what i should move towards what i should move away from what i should say yes to what i should say no to mm -hmm. and that is a living phenomenological experience which goes beyond my 
ability to articulate it. It is wider, deeper, broader, yeah, right, yeah. farther than I can articulate. And I have an articulated moral code yeah. to some degree. My particular moral code is, you know, more explicated, more explicit than most. Right. But at best, my moral code is uh, a subset. It's substandard compared to the depth and the number of constraints that my conscience is integrating. Yeah. <laughs> my articulation is always less than the reality. The best yeah. we can do in terms of describing reality is to constrain it, to omit measurements, and to have our concepts be integrated at best. Okay, so for me personally, my conscience is deeper than my explicit morality. Similarly with Rand, her novels are deeper than her explicit morality. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and so this gap between our conscience right, and our explicit morality can be refined and gathered by noticing what's our conscience. If we take our conscience, our phenomenological experience, to the degree that we have the time and the energy and the capacity, and turn that into a narrative and consciously examine the narrative, actually take it apart to notice how it's working and what are the principles involved, we can use that process to enhance our explicit morality, which will feed back into our conscience. And we can improve our conscience through this cycle of yeah. feeling, expressing a narrative, examining the narrative with our best understanding thus far, and, there, and therefore we set up a cycle or a spiral of improving our conscience. Did I hear that right? Yes, and I, and I also, as you said it, I want to include also that living out in reality and getting results and observing those results is part of this spiral. So yeah, there is this story spiral, but involved in that is also your day-to-day -day actions and virtues expressed in the world and the results they get for you. And so, 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 so I, I want to take this and bring it back into Rand in a particular way. I'm going to bring yeah. in some of my work and my interpretation of Rand to see how it fits. Sure. So we've got the big five, metaphysics, epistemology, ethics, politics, and aesthetics. Right. I, I say that there are right answers and wrong answers on each of these mm -hmm. kind of things. But the right answer on metaphysics is that there is, a, there is a reality that has a nature. Yeah. Right. Epistemology, that we can learn to approximate that nature, that we can improve our knowledge about that nature through valid understanding and concept formation. Mm -hmm. that, that we do responsibility, which is that we can then take that best understanding and make choices based on it in order to act in integrity with ourself. That just like reality has a nature, we have a nature. Right. And the, the nature is for us to take responsibility for the choices we make in our life. That there's politics, which I call respect, which is that we then take our choices in a way that respects the equal choices of others. That mm -hmm. we have freedom and responsibility just like they have freedom and responsibility and we treat them as if they have freedom and responsibility through respect all in service of beauty and the realization of ever increasingly beautiful expressions of self and ego that we are developing ourself and becoming more complex and that that is beautiful that that's the aesthetics so we've got the big five yeah, and I would just add, add that all those big five are in, in service of this healthy self that yeah. flourishes and feels happy. Ex That's the ultimate end. I would just add on ethics, I, I thought ethics was the weakest of your points because in the same way you described epistemology con dealing with concept formation and concepts and proper grouping categorization, Rand does a wonderful job on all that. But what she's not doing a wonderful job on in ethics is that the self, and the reason we need narratives, the self has to have a hierarchy of values, has to rank values, and to rank we must ultimately get back down to pleasure and pain. It's rooted in the metaphysical facts of pleasure and pain. And then as it grows, just like with the conceptual framework, it gets more sophisticated, and that's how we develop as children like likes and dislikes and favorites and so on, all the way up into 
very sophisticated personal developed self, which is ranking affects with using knowledge of reality and knowledge in general, etc. But that whole aspect needs to be explicated, brought out, and that is, I like to think of it as Rand missed the affective faculty. She hammers the rational faculty, missed the affective faculty, and that whole thing needs to be added to ethics. So, 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 so I'll, I'll agree with that. You know, in, in our future conversations, right, I talk about uh, prosperity, pleasure, and purpose, right? And you could say pleasure is the affective component, purpose is the narrative component, and, and prosperity is the, the wealth, health, that wealth, health, what we inherit in component. So there's a lot to say in terms of ethics, but in terms of these five, assuming, assuming that we explicate ethics more effectively, we could say we're dealing with the big five. I mm -hmm. simplify that down into something I call a genius spiral which is how do you go through each of these processes? And what I suggest is you look at reality and do your best, under, you, you do your best to look at reality. Then you use your best reason to actually describe it, to, to do the conceptual formation so that you can decide what's good or bad. And then you make choices based on that. You use your conscience and your best reason to determine, given the context I'm in, what is it that's most going to further my flourishing? rational self-interest of choice then you enact it in the world right and this is where you go from building a story the story leads to a choice or a set of choices and then you go out in the world and you actually enact the choices yeah right this is where the narrative meets reality and then you get feedback you get results the impact of your choices that comes out and that's in terms of the realization where you open to what's new and what's possible and you actually in the face of creating a story mm -hmm. making choices within the story and then enacting it then the world mm -hmm. then the world comes in and refines your vision you realize new things about the world you're confronted with the world and that allows you to go back and look at the reality create better ideas enact you know, choose those ideas, enact them, and then, and it's this spiral that, yeah. on the one hand, you have to, the more you create optimal stories, mm -hmm. the better your choices. But stories yeah. center around values. If you notice, yes. a character is pursuing a value. It's not ideas. He's got a value. He's got an obstacle. He has to face a dilemma and a choice. And then we get the resolution of what he, he resolved. Peacock talks about the primacy of A over B as being the theme of a story. And that's a very stripped down model of this, not like writing Atlas Shrugged, but a very stripped down model of this is what we're talking about in terms of putting our values into narratives. So, so it's not ideas. Ideas are important. Identification of reality is important, but it's not essentially about ideas. It's essentially about values. And that is a shift from 500 years of epistemology centrism in philosophy and Rand's epistemology centrism. We're shifting to ethics. We're shifting to values. Yeah. That's, a, that's exactly it. In, in this process, you take your ideas and then you put them in the context of your life, which is you are a character playing out stories. And that's how the knowledge becomes useful. It's useful in terms of the values of the character. The character wants things and therefore the knowledge becomes useful. I like to say reason requires a reason to use it. Mm. Right. Which is value, which means a value. <laughs> yes, yeah. exactly. This is the two, the two um, meanings of reason. We say reason in terms of thinking and we say reason in terms of motivation and value. And it's this integration through a story by keeping context. You, you think your ideas and you keep context so that you can make choices. Yeah. And we might go there. I want to I come back to the big picture. So let's say that this is true. Let's say, let's say that there's a reason to do this analysis. And the mm -hmm. fundamental reason is that we, we need to be practical in terms of our application of reason to ourself through our conscience. And this brings in a fundamentally narrative framework, which changes the last 500 years of an epistemological focus in philosophy and in Rand. We're now bringing in this narrative of values and prioritization. Mm -hmm. yes. 
highest ranking. Where, how does, where does it go from here? Before we get into like justifying all the things that we've said, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what are the implications for this? The, the implications that I see is a, a, re, a, a wider context of knowledge with which to integrate long-standing ethical problems. So ethics, basically, even Rand's ethics, needs sort of a revamping, a re That's fighting words. <laughs> so it's not that it's not that you're going to come out for um, laziness instead of productivity, but but a new understanding of what productive work means and a shift from seeing it as primarily about keeping your physical body alive with the hammers and the nails and building the skyscrapers the Industrial to, Revolution. to the work required to maintain your ego. Because suppose, imagine in our context, the, the, all the physical work is done by robots and AI, and humans are left to, what, what do we do in, in Rand's world? In, 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 so Rand had an ethics based on the Industrial Revolution. That's the mindset. That's what it's... That's that's what gave her the spark for it. Peacock even says that in a question and, our nephew asked, asked him. And we're going to live in a post-industrial revolution world. We're transitioning into that, where the material values that man requires will be produced by AI and robots. And what is humans left to do? There's still important things that uh, machines will never be able to do. Namely, the essential one that he, we need, our ego needs, is art basically, fundamentally. We still need art and the view of the world that we would like to see. And we could let robots build it all, but ultimately we have to create the vision, the artistic vision of what our cells, what kind of cells we want, what kind of society we want, and the material world we want. But we don't run out of meaning simply because we don't need to hammer a nail anymore and all the material wealth of the world is produced for us. Because, because when, as we shift from a rational animal self to a yeah. psychological self, yeah. we can take care of all of the needs of the body, yes. right? But it still leaves open an infinite set of worlds for the psychological self. Yes, right? which, and, which has no upper limit to, to yes. how to... And, yeah. and, and in order to address that, we need to deal with the psychological self so that we can design an yeah. ethics to help yeah. guide it through a world exactly. beyond its mere yeah. material needs, you could say, into, right. into the psychological and spiritual. Yeah, we need to... It, 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 so it's a re, uh, reconceptualization of human nature for a, you could say, a post... Um, industrial revolution society, which is focused on the ego and its self-expression and Remains its receipt and transmission. I mean, this is the world that we're living in. This is the world that that um, children are growing up in with the internet and the the tremendous, unprecedented ability to express yourself, to create art and Show it to the world, mm -hmm. and, and 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 that the that the self, yes, that you are creating is the ultimate artistic expression. Yes, actually. Yeah, it's that's a good way of thinking. It, about it. Yeah. it is. Yeah, it's it's sort of the ultimate end because the art is, it's going out and then it comes into other selves and back into yourself mm -hmm. and that thriving self is the. And the experience of happiness, which is its concomitant, is the ultimate end. The end if, if you choose happiness as your ultimate and end. With the understanding that that self is not a static thing that we achieve. It is an ongoing, yeah. growing, yeah. spiral process of development yeah. so that the art that we create is an expression of ourself. And that art helps us develop ourself, which allows yeah. us to create greater art. And there is no limit. So right. there's a feedback loop. It's dynamic right. and iterative. Right. Yes. And, the, and, 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 and spirals the toward and spirals towards greater beauty or spirals towards hell, heaven right. and hell, for lack of a better term. Right. And and what it's creating is meaning. It's another issue. The existentialists had a 
problem with. There is no intrinsic meaning in the world. We are the meaning makers, and that's the self's fundamental task is making meaning. So the art is an expression of the meaning that we're making. I would say yes. Um, and that meaning, when it's made in concordance with, in alignment with the developing spiral self, when the meaning is the growth of the self to ever increasing narrative levels, when the stories we're telling create a more profound self, Mm -hmm. that in the process of that development, we experience happiness. Like the, that is, that flourishing is happiness. The part I will add is that that is expressed not only in stories, as you said, but in reality. Yeah. It's when we take yeah. our story yeah. and turn it into art yeah. that, it, that that cycle continues. And, I, and I'll again put it in my terms for a moment that we tell stories and that's purpose. And in the process of telling the right story, telling stories that are congruent with and, de and maintain and replicate the self and grow the self, in telling those stories, we feel happiness and profound joy, and I'll call that pleasure. Mm -hmm. And then we express that through art, through the creation of production to productive work, and I'll call that prosperity. And so that fundamentally that, that prosperity provides the context that we tell stories about and the stories have us feel. And as long as we're telling pros stories that lead us to be prosperous and stories that are congruent with ourself and that have us feel pleasure, that this prosperity, purpose, pleasure, triad, this spiral mm -hmm. is fundamental that, and, and, and I'm, I'm willing to leave this for another time, but I, I, I want to say that it's, not pleasure and pain. It's not just stories. Yeah. It's not just what we create in the world. Right. Right. It's, it's, okay. but it's the art that we create. That's an expression of our purpose. And when we're aligned, we feel happy. And all three of those feed into each other. We might mm -hmm. even say they're three faces of the same piece when they are of a piece. Mm -hmm. I would agree, but, but you'd have to have an expanded definition of art to not simply include producing sculpture, paintings, and stories. What we're doing here is art. Yes. By, by yes. conceptual and, and, art that includes this. Yes, yes. And, and, when, and when we create software, we're doing art. Yes. And when we, and when we cook a steak, we're doing art. If we, if we infuse it with the yeah. expression of our meaning, if, we're, if, it, if it is part of a meaningful story, then the thing that we're creating in reality just to say it reflects our moral standards, virtues, and values. It reflects the core of us. Our ego. Yes. Yes. So, so I, have, I have one more thought, and then I think we should close for today, and we'll continue the conversation. Um, again, there's this rational animal conception of self mm -hmm. versus a psychological organism. Self as an organism, which is psychological and spiritual. Mm -hmm. Right? That... And you said that Ayn Rand right, is, has built a morality, an objective, explicit morality for the industrial age. Right. But that there is, that there is a realm of self-creation where the work that we're doing is creating the self mm -hmm. and embodying the self and expressing the self in a way that drives our stories and drives our happiness. Mm -hmm. And that one of the major criticisms against Ayn Rand, and if you're reading Atlas Shrugged, is that if you look at the plot, at the narrative, at the character, and the kinds of choices that they're making, whether it's Howard Rourke, or whether it's Kira, or whether it's Dagny, or whether it's John Galt, the kinds of choices that they're making, if you abstract them from the, cons from the context, are mm -hmm. fundamentally human. It's self-creation. It's the thing that we're talking about. They, yeah. are, they are acting in integrity with their conscience, and they mm -hmm. are working out through that process an yeah. ever-increasing articulation of the story mm -hmm. that fits the con conscience, this, this mm -hmm. deeper uh, experience of the infinite or, and 
not necessarily infinite, the real world constraints of being human beyond yeah. the stories that we've told. They're in the process of working that out. Now, the contexts that she created were industrial contexts. Right. right? Because she lived in that time. Yeah. Yes. So that was the world that she was in. And so yeah. some people read her and they focus on the context rather than the actual story of the character. The story of the character could go across any context. That's right. It could be an artist. It could be an environmentalist. It could be a, uh, a moral philosopher. Mm -hmm. It could be, it could even be a politician, EGADs, mm -hmm. right? That, that you could have the kinds of moral quandaries that her characters face across any context. Right. And so it's, it's interesting, or I'm, I'm curious what you think about it, mm -hmm. that, that there's the fact of the facts of the story, which are industrial. And in this, and in this case, focus on what you're creating in the world. Right. But then there's the higher level of the story where the stories are all about the creation of the self. Right. If you look at all of her work, it doesn't matter what the characters are doing. Her heroes are yeah. acting according to their deep conscience and creating a yeah. spiral of more and more meaning where the things mm -hmm. they're doing in the world are expressions of their meaning, that they are art, their lives, the things they're doing are art and that they live the happiness that that, in, that, that produces regardless of what they're doing. And, and there's a hierarchy. There's a preference for the ego over the external expression as evidenced by like Rourke refusing to build the building that was not an expression of his ego. He'd say, you know, I'd rather go work in the quarry than do that, give up architecture or all than those make something that in the valley. In the, yeah, or, or or the strike was about that. It was about when your work stops being an expression of your ego and supportive of your ego. And supportive of your ego, it's time to jettison the work because mm -hmm. the ego is the primary. Even if it even if it dramatically impacts your health or your yes. wealth or your life yes. or, or your life <laughs> or yes. your life ultimately John right. Gall threatening suicide it, yes and and this is this is the transcendence of reason not the jettisoning of reason not the reduction of reason but the application of reason to the highest possible good yeah it subordinates reason to the health of the self or the ego so reason, reason for being is for the health it's of the ego. It's a means to the end of the healthy Ultimately. ego. Because the healthy ego, the happy ego, is the end in itself. Yes. So and, the, and, the, and the happy ego is one who is telling stories that increase its integration, mm -hmm. that, that increase the integration of the constraints that it's working within such that it, yeah. such that it becomes more able to reproduce itself, maintain itself, mm -hmm. and, and energize itself. And, and also, there's also you. You mentioned it a couple times, Mark, and I like that. And I mentioned this to John. We need we need another concept. It's not simply maintenance. It's not simply defense against hostile attack. It's not simply reproduction. There's also an element of simply just enjoyment and just existing and enjoying and satiation. There needs to be that aspect of an, of the organism, like and sort of like Rand talks about an end in itself moment. There, that is also part of what an organism needs, I think, or at least humans. There's, there's sort of a work and then there's a relaxation cycle in the organisms, sort of a pulse of like you work and then you go on vacation and you rest and you enjoy, and you savor. You are, you are awake and you confront the world and then you sleep and you integrate. And yeah. In, in, yes. So, so, so with this, I, I just, I just want to say, when you look at Ayn Rand through this lens mm -hmm. and you recognize that fundamentally she is in her novels mm -hmm. about the creation of an ideal human being, an yeah. ideal self. Yes. Right? Yeah. And that, and that the stories and the characters are always in this process of increasing their integrity, increasing mm -hmm. their narrative form such that the works of art that they're creating, the work that they're doing is consistent with their self. Yes. And that that leads to happiness. Well, yes. she, she, she you, even says she's out to project the ideal man. Exactly. Exactly. And, and, when, and when you look at her work from that perspective and you mm -hmm. divorce that or you separate it 
from the context she used. I'm building mm -hmm. buildings, I'm creating railroad tracks, I'm, you know, I'm uh, working on steel or whatever. When you take yeah. it away from the context, it's mm -hmm. tragic and or hilarious that people think of Ayn Rand as dry, rational philosophy mm -hmm. because it is so alive and beautiful yeah. and thriving. She got the essence. And, she totally got the essence, but her theory doesn't support. It. And yeah. so, so the so the essence here is a new conception of egoism. It's saying that this animal needs to be subordinated to the ego, and this is what she demonstrated in her philosophy: that egoism, when we say it's about who the beneficiary is, there's a more nuanced view of egoism available here, which is that the ego is ego can be shifted from seeing ourselves as a rational animal to where our rational faculty is subordinated to keeping this biological organism alive to this biological organism is, is supported to keeping a symbolic organism, this psychological organism, this ego alive. This Healthy. is the this is a refinement or a new conception of egoism that fits with what Rand dramatizes in her fiction. Yes, and creates a new man qua man, a context yeah. in which to understand yeah. that, which, yeah, that's an idea. which, yeah. it, which is a, an entirely different level. Okay, great. So we're going to continue this conversation. There's yeah. a lot of threads that we opened that we need to provide support for. Yeah. And there's a lot further to go. So thanks for this conversation, John. I look forward to the, the conversations to come. It's been beautiful, Mark. Thank thanks, you. Mark. And, and thank you, Brashan.